Well, we'll start it off by saying I'm homeless, folks. Huh? <laughs> I got kicked out of my Malibu place. They, uh, that's a clinic, uh, you know, rehab for uh, wealthy people. And uh, they decided they wanted to make some changes on the property. So they had to have a building inspector come over and approve the changes that they wanted to make. So the building inspector decided to inspect everything on the property. Came to my house and he said, there's no permit for this house. you got to tear it down. Oh, my goodness. Oh my God. So I just got notice on Tuesday. Um, so everything is going into boxes. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I'm homeless. And they, they gave me till the 18th, but I'm leaving tomorrow for Thailand. So I have to have pack up everything in five days. You know? Jesus. Oh, <laughs> no. you have help? Do you no. Help no, I don't want any help because I want to know what exactly everything is. Thank you. Yeah, that's People did offer to help, but I can't afford it. I need to know where everything is. So I've been getting one hour of sleep a day. So, you know, they've offered me a, uh, you know, I, re I returned September 23rd to no home. So they had <laughs> some bungalows up near Canandoom Road. And one of them is one bedroom, so they're going to give me that till mid-November. Because as soon as I get back, I'm only back a week, and then I go on my next tour here. I go to Aspen, then um, Sedona, Chicago, and then St. Louis. So I'll be gone that whole month, you know, of October. So I'll have um, just two weeks in no uh, November to look for a place. Pardon? So you don't need a home then. <laughs> <laughs> I need one about three months a year, you know, here in L.A. So that one was a perfect one, my hot tub, everything. And they've got to bury the hot tub. As oh, illegal, no. So. Oh, I didn't know you needed a permit, but, you know, if I had gone for a permit for that hot tub then, I would have lost the house ten years ago. Oh, so that's when I built the hot tub. You've been there ten years? Been there eleven years. Oh, that's Eleven years. Yeah. I thought I was going to be able to be there for my life. Did you own the house, Agenis? No. No? no. I would have had a heart attack if I had to tear it down and it were mine. Oh, yeah. So it belongs <laughs> to Fred Siegel. So, uh, you know, he's the Fred Siegel clothing store. Are you were leasing it from him? Is no, I'm renting. Oh. Well, I was leasing on a yearly lease, but uh, he said that I could, because he's on the diet and it, saved his life and changed his whole life. Uh, he said that I could live there as long as I wanted, even after he's dead. In fact, he made a deal when he rented the lease the place to the, the oh, rehab center, the clinic, that I stay there no matter what. But the contract is on that house. The house is gone. That's it. So. You take it pretty good. <laughs> what am I going to do about it? I was upset for two hours. <laughs> Move on. Time for a change. Screw it. <laughs> Can't worry about it. So. Oh wow. Yeah. All I need, you know, I'm here so little, so it's okay. One, right. two Is days at a time. Packing your stuff up. Where are you going to keep your stuff? I mean, well, there they have a up. they have a Fred on his part of the land mm -hmm. that he didn't lease to them. Mm -hmm. He has a small storage house. He's going to put everything there for me. And I've got three boxes that just has everything that I absolutely have to have. So I'm not living in like a hotel, you know, because that's basically, I live out of a suitcase, you know, for nine and a half months a year. So. Is that your plan, just to come back there a month at a time or something, three times a year? Well, that's the way I'm doing it now. Mm -hmm. I'm going away for four months and coming back for two to three months, mm -hmm. and then going away again. So. Mm -hmm. And you're building a house in the Philippines, aren't you? A getaway Not house? yet. It hasn't started the one. It's all about about to begin there. Even though it's more remote, and, you know, no roads into that area, no paved roads, and I have to cross three rivers. <laughs> we got caught in one of the rivers and almost got washed out into the ocean, you know, when he and I were there um, last August. But that's finally bought the property, finally went through in uh, in January. Uh, so, I mean, it's been, because it's 618 meters up the mountain, 
and it's in, you know, forested land, and they are very particular about everything. So I had to, I had to get a permit and permission, and have the the town the, um, developers, uh, the city of um, Puerto Princesa, their engineers design the road because it's, I mean, this steep sometimes. So they had to build a road, which was a half a mile up the mountain to get to my property. It took them four months to build it. And uh, I had to get permission to take down the trees and, you know. So it's a process. It was a yeah. heck of a process. So then that was at the one end of the, the property is about uh, a half a mile long. Uh, to kilometer by uh, almost 60%, uh, two-thirds of a kilometer, you know, going back. So it's a big piece of property. The one in Thailand is only 34 acres. The one in Philippines is 108 acres. Only 34 acres. Yeah. And 108 acres <laughs> oh, is the one nice. in the Philippines. So they had to, I needed to, a lake build at the end where I was going to build the property because where it goes at that end, at the north end of the property, there's a river that runs down and some big waterfalls on it, and that runs all year round. Then along the back of the property, uh, there's a river that runs along the back and all along the other side. So on three sides of the property, there are lakes, now the uh, rivers. Now the one on the north end, that is so big that that's government owned. But my land goes right up to it. The one that's behind and on the other side is on my property. So what made you choose the Philippines? Pardon? What made you choose the Philippines? To, to because uh, it was the most remote area I could get without getting into hostility. You know, so, uh, you know, if I was gone towards Indonesia or Malaysia, there's a lot of hostility towards white people. You know, so I didn't want to get into that. And Filipinos love white people. I mean, Mar Americans. Joe. I don't know why. Joe. Huh? Joe. <laughs> no. I was in Northern Virginia. They kept calling me Joe. Hey, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> from GI Joe. Right. <laughs> from the Vietnamese guys yeah. during the Vietnam War, a bunch yeah. of GIs. But this was, uh, if you look at the Philippines, you've got the big island Luzon here where Manila is. And then you've got all these other islands that go off over here, Samar and Leyte. And then you have some fairly large islands there, which are uh, Bahal, Cebu, um, Negros. And those are popular ones. And then you have the big island, Mindanao here, and Samal and all the little islands around that. Then way over here, there's a long island, and that's Palawan. Where I am, there are only two percent of the roads are paved. Mm. So it's real. The town I live in, there are 200 people, and they're all spread out over, you know, about five miles. 200 people oh, over wow. a five-mile area. Wow. So, and they live off the land. There's no electricity. They have electricity one and a half hours a day, wow. and that's it. And because the city paid for a, a power thing uh, for them to have electricity one and a half hours a day. Do they so, fish? That yeah, that's what they, yeah. you know, it's right on the ocean there. Oh. So on my, on the place where I built my property was where the wind comes through because it's all mountainous there, you know, and I'm uh, probably two-thirds of the way up the mountain and all the way up to close to the top of that first peak. And it goes back about 12 miles oh. to more mountains. <coughs> and that river runs 12 miles all the way down through my property. I only hiked three miles back into the, to see, you know, how it was all the way back there, and nothing back there, but monkeys and animals. Drinking water must be good. Pardon? Drinking water must be good. Oh, I drank right out of that stream. That's what was nice. They freaked out because they, they're told malaria, they'll get malaria from it. Oh, my God. You know, I was drinking and I was bathing in it, you know. <laughs> they were freaked out. They thought so I was going to get malaria. <laughs> Well. They'll collect rain. They won't drink it out of a the stream. They're, they're indoctrinated to believe that they're going to get some disease. They're going to get malaria. And it's a falsehood. 
believe that mosquitoes give malaria too, and it's a, it's a joke. It's ridiculous. That's a, you know, a little bitty mosquito is going to bite you. Now think about this. The mosquito is a female. The only reason she drinks blood is to feed her offspring. She doesn't want that blood contaminated. She's not going to contaminate you when they bite you. The proboscis goes in and it bites as many cells as it can, so it creates a pool of blood. She sucks it out. No saliva involved in it or anything. So it's a whole ridiculous joke. Well, what about malaria? And that's what, that's, they say that's transmitted by... That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm talking about. It's a, it's a lie. Well, that well, must be a government malaria, lie. Malaria comes from not eating enough protein and getting very sick in a humid climate. Mm -hmm. And they only eat like 5%, 10% meats. Oh. The healthier ones that eat a lot because they're fishing. Around where I bought my property, there's a lot. But if you're one of the poorer people who has a big family, <clears throat> you know, they eat too much rice, you know, 80% of the diet is rice. The reason I was able to get the property because they don't allow any uh, foreigners over in that area was the second chief of this area, this district, or um, what do they call it, um, Barangay, um, I, he was supposed to show me the property the first time, and this was almost a year ago. It was about a year ago this time, February, as it was, a year ago, February. And uh, I went there to see it, and he said, I'm sorry, I can't spend the whole day with you. Two of my girls have malaria, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I have to take them to the hospital. They're really sick. So that was, you know, we had three, transla three languages to translate from, the native language to Tagalog to English, you know. So um, by the time it got translated to me, I said 76% of the people who go into hospital for malaria die in the hospital. Only 26, 24% die if they don't go into the hospital. So that was translated to him, and he thought it for a few minutes, and he said, it's probably true. Two of my girls, he had five girls. Uh, he said, five years ago, two of my girls got malaria, and I took, I took them to the hospital, and they were dead in 24 hours, less than 24 hours. And I said, all you do is you take two ounces of lemon juice, two ounces of honey, and mix it with six ounces of coconut water, and give them a tablespoon of that every hour for three days and then two tablespoons every two hours, or one tablespoon every two hours for another three days. So he did that. He took me to the property, spent the day there with me, and he gave that to the kids, and they were fine. So that was why they decided to oh, let me great. buy the property. Oh, oh, that's a great story. story. Yeah. So, um, there's a, they have a benefit for me being there. So otherwise, they would have sold it to me. Of course, I had to have a corporation, so, you know, where I own 60, 40% uh, and, and the Filipinos have to own 60. So I got a taxi driver, my driver. <laughs> <laughs> you have a taxi driver? And the, a taxi driver, he's, one, he's my foreman. He used to be in farming, now he's a, he's a taxi driver, so whenever I'm there, he devotes all of his time to me, you know. Taxi very driver. nice. So, um... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like uh, $20 a day. <laughs> Bargain. <laughs> yeah, tell me. $20 a day, and they'll take me everywhere, and he's mine for 24 hours. Wow. Um, you know, I've taken things all around the island. We had to rent a car. That was which the most expensive. But I shipped a FJ Cruiser over there because I got a retirement visa. I was able to... Uh, to uh, import a car. Uh, so uh, FJ Cruiser is like a cross between a Jeep and a Hummer. Oh, that's good. And it's a Toyota four-wheel drive. It's a true off-road vehicle. You can take those things and ride up the side of a cliff, you know, like this. Wow. It won't turn over. And because we got stuck in the river, you know, I needed something high, so it has six-inch lifts. So for me to get up in wow. it, i got to climb up <laughs> there. You know. So uh, it's an excellent, excellent car. Uh, in fact, uh, I have shots of uh, a car 
being washed out in the river like we did with an FJ cruiser that didn't have lifts on it. And it finally hit a, you know, it was floating just much out of the, t you just see the top of the car only. And then it hit a barge area, turned right on, drove right out. Mm. Wow. Cool. That's the car I want. Perfect. So, yeah, so I've got that there. It cost me a fortune. You know, they, uh, the FJ Cruiser, they don't import them there, but I found two of them only uh, for sale in the Philippines that had been imported by, imported by Filipinos who had lived other places in return and brought their cruisers with them. And they wanted $60,000 for them. Mm. So I bought it for 22000 here, and it's worth 46000 It's 2007. Okay. And it cost me 13000 almost 15000 to import it. So I still had to pay a fortune for it, but it's the vehicle that I want. So how do you get the gas? Pardon? How do you get the gas for it? Well, there's gas stations now. I thought you were so remote. Then. Well, uh, yeah, I have extra gas tanks, you know, to take with. Mm -hmm. What's your, plan for the property? Pardon? What's your plan for the property? I mean, you're going to do well, that property that. is just for me and relatives and friends. Um, but the one in Thailand will be a, a health spa. Mm -hmm. It's it's even, you know, when I got the, there, I can own 49% of the corporation. In, in Filipinos, I'm only allowed to own 40%. You know, so um, in uh, my attorney's, Brother, uh, the Spider. they actually they have to put it on. The <laughs> like I don't so <laughs> they have to be they have to be owners. They're shareholders. <laughs> shareholders. shareholders. Yeah, shareholders. So the, <laughs> the, basically, the way I set it up was they have certain responsibilities. They'll never oh. be able to fulfill it. So therefore, <laughs> the read their surviving entity will own it. So they really can't take it from me. There's no way they could do it. They couldn't afford to, to right. keep the land. Right. So I made sure of that. Um, and the one in Thailand, uh, I registered as a, um, a, um, a health spa. Yeah, a spider. Where? Region, a region, yeah. It's called um, oh my God. Uh, Flying Bird Farms uh, Health and Beauty Sorry. Um, <laughs> Rebirthing Spa. Me or him. <laughs> Thank um. you. So that's the one I will make into a, a clinic eventually, if my backers come in, you know, to help that way. I'm not going to build it myself. It's too expensive, and it's getting too much in there. It would get too much in the debt for me, and I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So. It's a good idea. Is that up near Chiang Rai? No, it's, uh, near, uh, it's part of Kong Tian province, where Udon Thani is. It's central. So late, late um, Dintian, Laos is here. You drop down about 100 kilometers, and there's Udon Thani. Then you drop down about 130, 140 kilometers, maybe it's 200 kilometers, Konkan, and I'm off about uh, 75 kilometers from that or more, probably 90 kilometers. So how will you feed the fish in your pond? Uh, meat uh, fish scraps. Right. I'll go collect them in town, and then after I'm while well, I'm there, I just feed them any any meat scraps that I have. Just throw it into the pond and eat. Do you think that's as good as ocean fish? Or uh, well, in Thailand, I can't get the ocean fish because I'm dead center in the country, so no water around me except for a huge lake, and there is a lake that's probably. Uh, about 60 miles long, and it's a. Uh, it looks like fingers if you see it. You know, it looks like a hand with all these fingers coming out of it. Um, and it's a pretty big lake. It's probably 40 miles wide, 80, 90 miles long, and I'm probably two miles from it, walking distance. But I'll take fish from there, and scallops, and I mean. Uh, uh, they have lots of, uh, like, shrimp, you know, freshwater uh, prawns, and I'll put those in my uh, fish pond and build my, uh, my aquarium.
<laughs> the aquarium that I will eat from. Yummy. <laughs> yes. So I mainly eat fish, you know, freshwater fish there. But when I'm in Palawan, you know, I the place where I cut the area for a house is overlooking. I've got a panoramic view of the ocean and the mountains. You know, so it's gorgeous. So that's only a, um, <clears throat> you know, about a mile down to the ocean from there. And I have a, do have a big old dirt bike and uh, now the FJ Cruiser to get around there. So I can go down fishing anytime I want. Are there uh, animals on Palawan, like cows? And yeah. Lots of that. There's uh, a dairy that's a government dairy that was a test dairy that was started. Uh, New Zealand funded it. Now they fund it, but there's, I get all the milk that they have. Mm -hmm. They only have two milking cows. You know, but they're, um, they're Holsteins, so there's very little fat, very little cream in them. And it's, so they're V2 cows, you know, A2s, I mean, uh, not A1s. So uh, the milk, even though it's nourishing, it's not as nourishing as I would like. So I will find some, uh, and there are on different islands, like on uh, Samal Island. There's 7,107 islands in the Philippines. I will do a lot of it, island hopping to see all of it. But I found a big dairy on uh, Samal Island, which is part of uh, Mindanao. And they've got a pretty big dairy there. And they have jerseys. So I will you buy either buy it from them or, you Can you know. buy a couple gowns? Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to buy a couple gowns. Yeah. I just have to put the fence up. Will you be able to get enough cream in a tropical environment from the cows? Or yeah, it's there that when you have a cow in the tropics, the vitamin D in it keeps it homogenized. So it doesn't separate the same. But I don't need it to separate in the tropics because I don't need, if you eat butter there, which I take with me, it causes a lot more perspiration and heat, body heat. I like the heat so it doesn't bother me, but people look at me dripping wet, and they say, oh my God, are you okay? I say, I love it. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but if you have the cream and milk, you don't perspire as much. Butter will make you perspire profusely. So I wouldn't make butter there. I would just have rich, creamy milk. So, so people coming in wouldn't be getting butter at the clinic? No. no. Well, I would import, probably import some, uh -huh. or somehow make some. And definitely, they would have, I would have to have milk for some, I mean, for butter for some sick people. I would find a way, you know, put a, a little bit of lemon or something in it to separate it, <clears throat> to make sure it's separated. So there's really no way to get butter in a tropical place from a tropical farm? Yeah, there is. You just have to have a certain kind of cow. Uh -huh. And they have to eat, you have to grow something that they'll produce more fat. Uh -huh. When they're eating the regular grasses there, no matter what it is, they're not going to produce much fat. What are you hoping to achieve with your health spa? Uh, help people get well. That's all. Because yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of people who need, you know, daily help. You know, and I've not set up for that, and I've had a lot of people ask me for that over the years. Mm -hmm. People with cancer or MS, serious problems that could get well fast if I were there to help them. Mm -hmm. so. And so I would be for that. Yeah. Are you going to be doing any training when you set up your Well, house? if I set that up, I will definitely do training. I have probably anywhere from 20 to 40 students. Yeah. And most of them will be in tents. You know, so. Intense trainings. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm right at the foot of the, the mountain forestry in, uh, in Thailand. Uh, so they're pretty delicate about, you know, how it's used. They've stopped me from digging my lake three times. You know, they say that's, I said, but I own it. And they said, no, you don't have a Chinook property yet, property title. So we say what does, what happens with that land. So, in, you know, two more months I get my Chinook deed. So all they're doing is delaying it. But they've delayed it. Uh, now they've delayed it enough where the rainy season starts in about a week, <laughs> two weeks, so I won't be able to dig it out, you know, when I finally get the chinote out have to wait till next year to drain it, you know, wait till next year. I have to drain it for irrigation. But I've dug it 30 feet deep, 
you know. And right now it's dug like, a, you know, almost like a, well, this is a horseshoe, like here, here's a, almost a square cut over here. And the land in the center is lower because all the dirt that was used was built up a dam on the sides in front. So it's going to be more than 30 feet deep. So I'm going to have to let a lot of the water out to be able to dig it, you know, from the opposite side. Or I could just leave it as a beach, a beach front, you know, where the water goes into the water like that. So if you were training these people, how would they be able to stay in Thailand for the whole? Uh, uh, they would get uh, a student sort of permit uh -huh. every year. You can renew it. I have to re I got my uh, retirement visa in Thailand, I mean in Philippines, but not in Thailand because it's not conducive. You can't do business if you become um, a, uh, you know, a, a retiree in, in Thailand. So I have to renew every year. In the uh, Philippines, I'm lifetime. But you were you were a student visa or how do you stay in Thailand for a year? Well, I'm a business person. Uh -huh. So I get my business permit every November. It goes for a year. Um, and I have to do that indefinitely. Every year I have to renew for a year. But if anybody wants to be a student, they apply for a student permit. And that's a yearly basis. But my course would run about three years to four years. So they just have to reapply every year? Pardon? They have to reapply every year? Yeah, they have to reapply, even though the, my course would be three to four years. Yeah. Probably three year course. Mm -hmm. and what would be your prerequisites? Pardon? What would be your prerequisites? Uh, you know, the book, back books, every information in the books, and the DVD, and my newsletter is backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to deal with the knowledge of what foods do what. You'll already know that. We deal with the patient. Mm -hmm. Watching the changes in the patient, know what to look for, how to uh, analyze the health. It would be diagnostics, but I'm not allowed to use that word because I'm not a licensed doctor. But it's basically how to observe what's wrong with the patient, what to know, how to know what's wrong with the patient, and if there are questions, how to find out. You know, by observing them, what is the problem? What are the problems involved? And then how to deal with them on a changing basis. Mm -hmm. On a daily basis. Would you so, be teaching them iridology at all? Yeah. Yeah. And every uh, so, if I have let's say 40 students, uh, there would be a group of uh, four groups of 10, and each one of them would write one of my books. Next books on training. One would focus on iridology. One would mm -hmm. focus on uh, physical appearances, coloring, you know, skin coloring changes, swelling, stuff like that. So a book on that, symptoms. Um, and then a book on uh, uh, treatment, you know, how to treat them. And then another book on the overall, how to put it all together. So there would be 10 students, students concentrating on a particular phase of my <coughs> clinic. So by the time we finished, I wouldn't have to have more students, although I probably would. And there would be training guides and movies taken. We'd have videos, everything, record everything, you know, mm -hmm. for that three-year period, so that people all over the world, without having to come to Thailand and be with me, could pretty much get it. Yeah. How yeah. to do it? Yeah. They, so they. But those 20 to 40 who would be there with me would know it. Yeah. They would know it. They would be me. So I figure 40 people can take care of the world. <laughs> big world. I know. <laughs> and what happens to the rest of the people that are back here while you're over there? As far as well, I'll still be bouncing back. I'll find the two or three or four smartest ones there. They really get it because there's always a few of those. Because all the people who've uh, applied are very, very bright people. You already have them? Oh, I've got probably 80 people who've applied. But you've already... And I'm only going to take half of them at the most. Cool. Maybe only apply? a fourth. How do you apply? Uh, you just send me an email and let me know that you're interested. 
and I tell you the prerequisites are you have to know the books backwards and forwards, and you will be tested. If you don't pass the test, then you won't be, you know, you won't. Do you have uh, any MDs? It. Pardon? Do you have any medical doctors? Yes, I've got three medical doctors. Good. Probably about 20 nutritionists. What are you going to do with that? Pardon? What are you going to test for? I'll test them on the information in the books, my books. Uh, Are going to do that later on the time? Yes, that'll all be done at the same time. All that testing work. As soon as I know that, you know, the, the food's growing on a continuous basis, because I have to have the food, there can't be an interruption in it. So um, I'll have that. Certain things I'll farm out to local farmers that are around. They will grow. Uh, other things I have to grow. Now, right now, there's no coconuts growing on my property in Thailand, and that takes seven years to get to the point where, you know, so I have to farm out the coconuts from somewhere else, but practically everything else, you know, we can grow on the, the land. Some, you know, fruits that uh, take seven years to grow, of course, I won't be able to, to grow those. It's one of those injection spots wow. flaming up again. Wow. It's anniversary. <laughs> What's your time frame? Um, well, it depends on when the money comes and start building the property. Um, I'm going to be working for the next four months in both locations, growing food, getting fences up for the animals. So um, I should have everything very established. Uh, you know, I've got the layout for the property, where the food's going to be growing, you know, how it's going to be organized and laid out. Can I have your hot tubs too? I will have them. No, I mean for the retreat. Oh, there will be probably 20. Mm -hmm. 20 of them. But they're going to be designed like those in um, in uh, Vietnam. Like if you go to uh, Nha Trang, Vietnam, you can go to a spa. And you won't hear about it. It's Even though heavy touristed from all over the world, the locals, most of them don't even know that it's there. So it's, you know, it's publicized. People from all over to Asia come there. And you get into these wooden tubs. Two people can fit in. Um, and they have fire hoses. And they pump uh, liquid clay. You know, it's like plaster, players thick. And you just pack yourself in it. And you stay in there for 20 minutes. And then you get out, you go into the shower, and the shower, and then you get into a hot tub. You know, they've got different sizes Sounds of great. hot tubs to get into <laughs> for the family and for the individuals. And then you stay in there about 20 minutes, and then they have uh, a huge swimming pool and some small swimming pools that are no chlorine, nothing, just running natural hot springs, hot, oh, nice. very nice and perfect temperatures. So it's a wonderful, it's like $50 a day, it really is. That's even expensive for, for, um, for uh, Vietnam, but that's the kind of thing I want to have. Not to have a lot of people, but for the people who are sick, I want to have that kind of a, a clay resource. So I have to truck in probably, dig a hole, you know, very deep hole, and uh, have probably five truckloads of that clay and then have it put into a pool of, of water, a spring of water to keep it moist, and then, of course, something to heat it. You know, hot spring, probably dig down and uh, drill down until I hit a, a hot spring, you know, and let that come up and heat the clay, and then pump it in, and just recycle it. Uh, yeah. I've been to, been to Mesco Canyon, Ivy Hot Springs. Oh, yes, I've been there many times, that yeah. Clay, yeah. But that's this hard, and they put it on a plate. This stuff is liquid. You just shoot it in. Oh, you shoot it into soften. the bath. Well, you put it on, you would salt, and then it gets hard with the sun. Yeah, but it's still hard. I don't know where they get that clay from. It's red clay. Yeah, they import it from Northern California. But it's, you know, it's they put it on this big concrete right. um, pillar, and then they pack it on there, and it's about as hard as... It's about as hard as pottery clay, 
But this place in Vietnam, I mean, this is plaster of Paris Does thin. Does it get hard from the sun, the one you're talking about? Or they don't they let it harden. Oh. They're like me. I don't believe in letting it harden because that dries all, pulls all the fats out of your cells and your skin, kills you a layer or two of your skin. What you want is the bacteria from the clay to go in and help nurture and pull out without pulling out all the fats. And that's what happens if you let it dry. So when I go to Ivy, I just stay in the oh, mud pool. Right. And I just keep wetting it, keep yeah. it wet, you know. And I stay in the water with the clay. Does it feel stimulating when it dries? Is it kind of... I don't let it dry. Oh, that's right. You don't let it dry. Yeah. If but it if does, you, your true. skin will dry. Oh, okay. It'll draw up, but it'll die within a few days because there's no fat in it. It draws all the fat out of the cells. Oh, okay. So it's not a good thing. Maybe for someone with very oily skin. Like we used to use the face yeah. mask when you're young. And yeah. All <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's start asking questions. You ask questions and I'll try to answer. Daniel. Uh, I was wondering if you could just kind of briefly review the pH buffering in the body and, you know, maybe go over a lot of the, the common ideas out there that the blood pH is supposed to be a 7.4 or something like that and your saliva is usually around 6.5 and your urine can change based on what you're dumping and then um, maybe a quick review of the buffer system because a lot of people are drinking the alkaline water but the body if you get too basic it's going to buffer can you review how that buffer system works and well the body's always trying to balance itself now there's a belief out there in the alternative community that we want uh, you know about seven point uh, anywhere from six seven to seven point two blood uh, alkalinity acid to alkalinity ratio However, in native tribes, it's anywhere from 5.2 to 5.8. Mine has been 5.5 five for however long I can remember. And uh, my blood, my urine, my saliva are all around 5.5. Five. If you're alkaline, you're in trouble. The whole system works on an acidic basis. All, most of our digestive juices 90 to 95 percent of our digestive juices are acid. Hydrochloric acid is 100 percent acidic. There's no alkalinity to it. It's about a 5.2 to a 4.9 to a 5.2. So if it is highly alkalinized, that means it's not going to work well to break down acidic tissue quickly, like meats, um, cheeses, uh, any kind of meat, whether no matter if it's fish, fowl, or, uh, or four-legged animals, red meat, they will not break down and dissolve properly. And you only have 20%, <clears throat> 10 to 20 percent of your digestive acids are, are part of digestion. 80 to 90 percent is supposed to be bacterial. So your digestive acids are to break the larger particles of particles of food into smaller particles so the bacteria can infiltrate it and eat it. Their byproducts are their waste is our food. So we're really piss and shit eaters. <laughs> Technically that's what we are. So um, that's 80 to 90 percent of digestion. If it goes into alkalinity like a cow or a horse or any herbivore, you're going to be a vegetarian. And you're not going to live healthfully and well. So that is a whole fallacy that, you know, uh, a lot of the early, so-called early um, alternative thinkers in nutrition, they came up with a stupid idea, Walker and Fry and all of them came up with that ridiculous tale. Um, no evidence, no scientific evidence to prove it. Uh, they didn't test the saliva and the amount of bacteria that's necessary in the saliva to have proper digestion. And in, a, in healthy human beings, they have more bacteria in the mouth than a dog and a cat do, than dogs and cats do. So um, we are supposed to be thriving with bacteria. This is where the digestion starts in the mouth. 
We don't have hydro, I have hydrochloric in the mouth because they severed my vagus nerve. And that's what caused me a lot of tooth problems once I regenerated from the radiation therapy. But most people do not have a high um, uh, hydrochloric acid content in their mouth. It's other acids. Um, and you only have one small amount of tylen enzyme, which is the only alkalinizing enzyme in your mouth. And only the horse has that. And the horse uses a profuse amount of it. We seem to develop it after being a grain eater for thousands of years because none of the tribes that have stuck with the native diet have traces of tylen in their mouths. Um, so basically, we should be an acidic body from top to bottom. This should be in the 6.77, you know, alkaline acidic ratio. So it's not, should be. it's not true then that cancer cannot grow in an alkaline body? That's all bullshit. I've seen mm -hmm. thousands of people with that. I mean, literally thousands at these clinics that feed them only vegetable juice. Right. And I've watched them drop sure. off dead and left and right dead. You know, even though they have that alkalinity. So it was a hypothesis that somebody, uh, what was his name, put it out there. Um, Gerson? Walker and Gerson. No, Gerson was into your raw liver. That was the yeah. main thing, raw liver. You can't get an alkaline with raw liver. Raw liver is 90% protein. You have very little fat in the liver. It's like the heart. There's nothing that's, you know, those two organs, the heart and the liver, are basically your major protein bodies in the system, and they're highly acidic. You know, so uh, Gershwin, you know, Gershwin, when he was around, Max, when he was around, then 60% of his diet was raw liver. Now that his daughter's taken it over, she's removed the liver, and these people are dying just like every other vegetarian regime. So the consequence of being too acidic. <coughs> That your body will want to buffer that system and make it, make it. I mean, if you're too alkaline, your body's going to want to make it acidic. Does that mean it's going to be dumping positive ions into the blood, like the minerals from your bones, and then? Oh it yeah, it's going. Go it's going to take it from everywhere it can. <coughs> like you people who. Contributing to osteoporosis then by being yeah, too alkaline. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it definitely will. That's why so many vegetarians and fruitarians have bone degeneration. But doesn't the body leach calcium from the bones to alkalize the blood? Pardon? Isn't the, the calcium leached from the bones to alkalize the blood? No, it's to bind with toxins. It's to neutralize, let's say, you, take, you have something cooked, and in it you've got acid, acidic compounds which are free radical, mercury, lead, cadmiums, uh, any of those toxic metals, the body will use the calcium to neutralize those because they're free radical acid minerals, not because they're in proper ionic bond and proportion, you know, like in a raw diet. Very different. Calcium is an alkaline mineral, though, correct? A calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium are the ones that we mainly use to neutralize free radical acids. They need an acidic environment to be properly used. Um, Pardon? Calcium, they need an acidic environment. No, if you didn't have calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and potassium, we wouldn't be alive. But our ratio needs to be right around 5, 5, 5, 7. You know, not 7, not 6.7. That's an herbivore. Become a cow next life. If you want that. Oh, when yeah. I have a cold, I've been told to have a glass of eight ounces of water and put a quarter, half a teaspoon of baking soda in there to alkaline instead of keeping it acid. But baking soda is an acid. How can it alkaline your body? That's you got me. <laughs> you got a, me. Is that a good yeah. thing? What no, baking soda is a very nasty thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It acts like, uh, you know, uh, ascorbic acid. It will leach fats out of the blood. So, yeah, you'll reduce your symptoms, but you won't get well. What about uh, apple cider vinegar? Apple cider vinegar is very helpful. 
a lot of the amino acids that you use in chelation therapy are in the apple cider vinegar. So if you want a chelation therapy, take a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar a day. So the body will leach calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and potassium out of your bones to help neutralize over acidity from cooked foods or poison, but not from raw foods. You'll never have over acidity from it. And when you've been on long enough and healthy right now, I'm down to, you know, when I do it, uh, one juice a day. I haven't had a juice for three weeks. I don't have to worry about that over acidity anymore very often. When I get into the tropics, I do more because I perspire more. So I will drink more vegetable juice when I'm in the tropics. So would one on a, a cooked diet rather be acidic? Or would There'll one be on a, a tox diet better, rather, toxic. Toxic, it better depends. If they're a vegetarian, alkaline. if they're a vegetarian, they're going to be highly alkaline and toxic. But on a cooked diet, would one rather cooked be slightly alkaline? Sad, sad American diet? Standard yeah. American diet? The sad diet? Yeah, the sad diet. The sad, sad diet, 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 yes. The sad diet, they're going to be overly acidic if they don't. Right, so are they better off being slightly alkaline? Well, they're eating enough alkaline foods to promote. Uh, they'll, never be a, they'll never be alkaline without pouring vegetable and fruit juices into yourself. That's why, you know, these clinics have you drinking like you know, a gallon and a half, two gallons of vegetable and fruit juices daily. Because you cannot get alkaline. The body will resist it. And finally when you do, it's broken down and exhausted. How, how do you People check, don't get well easily. How do you check to see what your pH is? How do you know? Well, I know because I use one of those strips and also oh. I had medical doctors, you know, once in a while, like a, a um, St. Louis, uh, in St. Louis, Washington University Medical Center did a rundown on people who were raw fooders. And I was one of the test subjects. And I was the healthiest one that they'd known. But I was only two, I was only one of three people who were not vegetarian raw fooders. So I outperformed in all of them, every, everywhere. And uh, this was a cardiac doctor, famous uh, cardiac doctor for athletes. You know, you're talking about big time athletes, uh, you know, who make the profession, you know, basketball teams, football teams, and stuff like that. He's the doctor for all the, most of those big full time stars when it comes to cardiac um, therapy and analysis. And, uh, on one of the floors of the hospital, they have a track and all kinds of workout equipment, you know, pumping iron. And, and they took me, uh, they did all the blood tests with me because I told them I was eating at least a stick of butter a day, you know, and lots of meat, oh, cholesterol galore. And this is a heart doctor, <laughs> you know. So, you know, he said, I'll pay your way here. I'll pay everything, you know, come. So I went there on my way to, to St. Louis to do a uh, workshop in St. Louis uh, for Jeff and the people there in St. Louis. So I spent uh, a day there uh, through the tests. Um, they only found a little bit of blockage here, uh, a little bit of taking in this artery, but that was since I was a little kid. Um, I started using, since I found it was still there, I started using vinegar to help break it down. Uh, so it's probably broken down by now, because this was like seven years ago, six years ago, that uh, I did those, that test. And after all the tests, he, the doctor was so amazed at my condition and the blood results, everything. I mean, they gave me a glucose tolerance test. First time I had sugar since 1974, so I was like this. Gave me high blood pressure, everything. But still the test results came out phenomenal. So he said, can we do some more tests on you? And you sign these waivers. So it was just athletic stuff. So he took me, I ran around the, you know, the track about uh, seven times, which is about a quarter of a mile, <coughs> without stopping, without resting. And my heartbeat was normal within 90 seconds. He said he had never seen that before. 
and then they put me on pumping iron. And I said, I don't exercise, but I haven't exercised since 1979. So he said, okay, we'll take it easy on you. And then he took it too easy, <laughs> start up 20 pounds weight, you know, <laughs> 20 pounds each time going up. And then we got to high, there was 10 pounds increase of time. I said, would you come on with this? I'm going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger just on the end of the stay. You know? So we got up to, I got 240 pounds with the leg presses. And when he saw me even slightly strained, he stopped me. He didn't want to have a heart, be to have a heart attack. You know? So 240 pounds there. Got up to 195 before I started straining on the bench press. Stopped me right there, and I could have done it. You know, probably gone up to about 230, 210, 230. But he stopped, and he said, "I've never seen anything like this before. We have people who work out here three days a week, and they can't do what you do." What did he do with that information? Pardon? I wonder what he did with that information. He's probably coaching under the, you know, doing what the uh, the Austri Austrians do. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger, raw eggs, raw milk, raw meats. So, probably what he's doing with it. Yeah, I mean, it's a beating his own. He can't be out there. Yeah. No, he's not going to be out there against yeah. anybody. But he's going to have his secrets with his yeah. athletes. Yeah, and he'll make more money out of it. Yeah. It's usually their intention. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was wondering when he worked for the city woman, he has a cesarean, has to stay out of life for about 18 years? Uh, it can be that long. Depends on how young they are when they get started. I had one woman who uh, was probably, went on the diet when she was about 27 and she had a cesarean and it took her about 12 years. But anybody in their 30s and up, it usually takes about 17 to 18 years. So about 40? Pardon? What if she's about 40? Probably about the same. And why 17, 18 years. Why is it that they have to uh, be able to wait much longer? Because when you cut into the body and you block circulation, it blocks normal lymphatic flow, everything. So everything has to be side, like here. I pushed through an aquarium when I was 16 years old, and I pushed on an aquarium to move it. And you're supposed to lift it, move it. I pushed it and went right through it. And it slid me. So you got a fish hook here and a little fish here. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> it just cut me open. It cut all the arteries and veins here. I mean, I was gushing. I was uh, hitting probably that black wooden chair there with my, every beat of my heart. You know, so had to put pressure on it. But if you see, I have no veins that go down this area. Here you see I have all of them that normally flow straight down. Here, all of them had to bypass this area. All of them went around the cut to regrow. See. Yeah. So, the woman, after she's gone through that year, is her lymphatic system be rebuilt and that's It'll still be different, <coughs> but it's harder to unblock. <coughs> and usually during that, when you have a cesarean, you have methylate or mercurochrome. Uh, administered or iodine, which are these are poisons, on those in those incisions that poisons the area. Of course, you need more fats to deal with all that poisoning that's stuck in the tissues there. So you need that extra fat there to bind with it and pull it out of the tissues. So it can become normal. This here, this scar right here, was this big and this high in spots and it turned cancerous after the incision. But I still have a few knots right here yeah. from the iodine, I mean the mercury that was used as an antiseptic during surgery. Right here I still have three knots, little elevated scars that every time I start, you know, this will turn a little inflamed and I'll start getting heavily nauseous and maybe have little breakouts all around in this area. You know, it happens now about every two and a half to three years that I go through it, and I taste the, the chemotherapy, and I taste the metal in my mouth when I'm detoxing. And when I go through that, I've always gained a lot of weight. Otherwise, it won't do it.
So what like a sprint. Would manifest from a, if it went if a woman had a cesarean and didn't gain the weight. And she probably wouldn't detox it. She'd just die would, younger. What would end up? Oh. She could get cancer or many things that could the happen in that area. The amount of in this country is. Oh, cesareans are a big issue because doctors don't want to wait around anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's all about them waiting around. That's all it's about. Yeah, 99% of the cesareans are because the doctor does not want to wait. And they make up stories. And they lie. You know, we had to do a cesarean because. It's a lie. Absolute lie. It's just easier for them. Pardon? It's just easier for them. Of course, it's convenient. They make more money. They don't have to sit around and wait for a hospital. Wait for some dumb woman <coughs> to have her dumb kid. You know, that's basically... Another number. Think about it. If you're that callous to cut somebody up and butcher them and decrease their life of value, you know, and their joy of life and sexuality, it changes everything. So, you know, think about the man who can do that. Or what kind of conscience does he have? Or they'll give you the drip where they may bring on induced labor, it's called. That's what I have. Yeah, but that still takes time. But it's easier it's not probably to. not a good thing either. Oh, no, it isn't. You know, it's basic that they're using LSD to do that. It really brings it on. Yep. Um, you get a trip while you're doing it. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's just like we're getting very, um, uh, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. It's really very yep. personal thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah, drugs take over. Okay, do you have a uh, Daniel, I took you. Do you have a question? You. Oh, I don't, no, I don't think so. Right Jeff, do you have a question? Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably do on the spot. A couple, couple things you mentioned earlier. Uh, you, you were telling the malaria story, and you made the coconut water, lemon, and honey concoction. Uh, that made me think of a question. Then you mentioned the A1, A2 thing on the milk, so that was the question. While you were telling your malaria story, Stacy told me when she was in the Philippines several years ago, they were telling her if you get full we'll Thailand. Uh, oh, Thailand. But same. Thank this you. is just to further uh, illustrate the, the ridiculousness of these malaria mosquito bite stories. So take it away. They <coughs> said uh, if you got bitten by a mosquito during the daytime, you would get malaria. If you got bitten by a mosquito at night, you would get dengue fever. Uh, <laughs> same, yeah, same mosquito. If he bites you at two, it's malaria. If he bites you at eight, it's, you know, dengue And just fever. think about it. What do mosquitoes eat? They eat nectar. They pollinate the tiny little flowers that bees can't hold on. You know, the tiny little flowers a bee got on it, it would crush the flower, the whole plant, like tiny little microbe clover and stuff like that. That's what mosquitoes do. They pollinate tiny little flowers. And my friends that took the malaria medication. They don't eat shit, so how are you going to get dengue fever? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> they were ready to kill sense. each other out of paranoia. Out of yeah. They were like delusional yeah. on the medication. Yeah. And what happened uh, three years ago with that English boy? He came over, took the malaria every day. He got malaria mm -hmm. and died. British, famous British citizen. Oh. So it went all over the place. And it's documented in his diary how he took the medication every day. Died of malaria. So, so it's all horseshit. So then what, the, so the, the concoction, the coconut water, lemon, honey. Uh, lime. 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 Uh, I was just going to say, you mentioned a protein deficiency. That certainly is not a protein-rich concoction. Uh, what's going on during a detox, well, I guess, the, so the so-called malaria that they're calling it is a detox of what? What are these people detoxing? Just to Highly detox? acidic proteins. Like their cooked meats, you mean? Or? Yeah, like their cooked meats. Uh, well, they also use a lot of spices, a lot of hot spices. Uh -huh. And when you're low in protein and you're doing that, you cause internal burning all over the place. Okay. And when you're detoxing that much at one time, it's a huge detoxification. It's worse than pneumonia. Okay. Because you'll, you know, pneumonia, you, you're not usually passing out and delirious. Okay. Most people aren't. But when you're going through malaria, you're delirious. Everything's going crazy. 
Okay, so it's just a crazy detox. Obviously yeah, it's so an extreme by, detox. Yes. Extreme detox brought on by a climate, though. You don't see malaria in dry climates, really. No, much. it's from the, because you detox better in a hot, hot climate. Right. So if those people were eating the way you eat, there wouldn't be any. Yeah, and also you got higher fevers in a, in a, a cool. tropical environment. Uh -huh. So your fever is going to get higher, and you're going to have more symptoms of delirium. Okay. So the coconut water in that cools the system? Uh, well, what it basically does is help the body alkalinize the over-acidity from the deteriorating tissue. When you eat a lot of hot, spicy food, it causes over-acidity, over mm -hmm. and not a good acidity, an abrasive right. acidity. Like so many things, it comes down to quantity or quality, not quantity. So when you just talk out acid and alkaline, you know, your raw liver, you said, is acidic. Red yeah. meat's acidic. But those are like quality... Yeah, and the acids are proper balance. Right. If you cook it, then it becomes overly acidic. And imbalanced. Imbalanced. Right. So. Uh, well, when you cook anything, phosphorus is destroyed and altered as little as 98 degrees. That's why they can tell whether something is pasteurized or not. If the phosphorus is cauterized, they say it's been pasteurized. And you can. Pad, you know, you can pasteurize at 121 degrees and see that the phosphorus is cauterized. Normal pasteurization temperature is 141. Usually potassium starts cauterizing about 170. Uh, and that means it's really not usable. Calcium becomes cauterized, 50% of it in milk, and pasteurized milk is destroyed. It's already cauterized, so it's unutilizable. So when you cook something, it breaks down and destroys the alkalinity, so there's no balance. Uh, and the acidity, the acid minerals, they have a tolerance, a labile point that can be hundreds of degrees. So then uh, the other question I'd ask you, you briefly alluded to that whole A1, A2 thing, and I've read stuff about that. I almost kind of chalked that up as to, as you might say, more laboratory kind of theory and all that. I mean, well, so did I until I started drinking that milk uh -huh. uh, from an A2 cow and, uh, and the Holstein, and I noticed that it made me slight nauseous. I didn't have as much energy. It certainly tasted good, and I felt better with it than without it. You know, being in Asia for a long time, I didn't I ran out of butter, and I was about three weeks out of butter, and uh, you know I was hungry. And the coconut cream is just not an animal fat, and I would eat tons of fish. I could eat three pounds of fish a day and still not got to get enough fat for me because of all the stuff I'd been through. My body, particular body, needs a tremendous amount of fat. So, because other Polynesians, you know, I mean, Asians uh, uh, on the Philippine Islands live just on fish, and they don't eat a lot of it, maybe a pound a day, and they're built and they're stocky, but I just can't survive on it. I have to go find big fat strips of meat hanging, you know, and I'll buy a whole five pounds of it, and I'll eat two pounds a day, you know, just to, if I don't have my butter. If I have my butter, I can have a stick a day, a half a stick a day, and do okay. But when I don't, I have to have a tremendous amount of fat. But when I had the, that milk, it wasn't quite nourishing. It didn't take care of it like the A1 milk does. And it was repeated. I did it three times with the same milk from the same cows, the Holsteins, from New Zealand. And it was that way each time. And as soon as I went to a place with jerseys or other, you know, A1 cows, perfectly uh, fine. You, even in that climate, you mean? Even in that climate. Okay, I was just yep. going to say, you think it was just more of a climate, like what you were talking about earlier, with how yeah. it's sort of naturally homogenized and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. but I mean, there clearly there's plenty of 
Holstein cows in the states that people have consumed raw milk on and yeah. gotten their you know, improved their health. And yeah, right, like definitely. But it doesn't. It I can tell it isn't as good. Do you think it's just simply the Jersey cow is so much richer and fattier, and that's kind of where it? I think that's probably it. More so than the whole A1, A2 yeah. micromanagement. Just mm -hmm. the Jersey cow's really fat milk and the Holstein lean. No, I've had Holstein milk before, okay. but not in that climate. Okay. So I don't know for sure. But it could be have to do with the microbes too, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Are there goats over there? And Lots of goats. For cows. Lots, of, but I don't do well with goat's milk. I get hyperactive and overly sexual. So. Because it's a more energetic animal. Yeah. Yeah. You ever seen a skinny, calm goat? I don't need those adrenaline precursors. If I were an athlete or somebody who enjoyed being physical, then it would be fine. But I, I can't. Call, I want to do things instead of being mentally focused, and I'm a mentally focused individual. Do you have a question? Yes. I just need some clarification on a couple of things you told me to eat. Um, the oysters, you said three a day, is that just for 30 days and then do you just stop or? No, you can do it longer than that, but I'd say it's probably going to take at least 30 days. And same for Alicia too. Pardon? And same for Alicia. Probably hers will be okay in 30 days. Okay. She just has a spot of it here in her brain. Mm -hmm. You've got this, you've got this iodine all over. The only place you don't have much is in this area right here. This area here, a little in the right side of your back. Otherwise, you're just coated with iodine mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And okay. the oysters will get rid of that, huh? Oysters will help get rid of it quicker. Oh. And the fruit, you said, have that for 30 days, the strawberries, raspberries, and watermelon. Is that like a fruit meal? And then after the 30 yes. days, what what do I do? Do I replace it or just Well, it I want to see how you are at that time. If you have, but you're not going to be here. If you have the same symptoms, oh. you can email me. Okay. If you have the same symptoms, you know, then you stay on it. Just continue. Okay. All right. And when you go to the hot springs, you're talking about the sport, form, I mean, um, the special sport from the gate to me, but that there's no pineapple before that, right? You don't take the pineapple drink if I'm going well, to the hot springs. Well, if you're going to a health spa like Glen Ivy and you're going to spend the whole day, right? that, you know, it's best to take a lot of watermelon. Just watermelon and watermelon eating, helps yeah. you perspire better right. than any other food. And do you take cream with that or? You can. Yeah, that's what I do. I always drink. Let's say if I'm going to have a, a round slice of watermelon that's about to stick in about this round, uh -huh. and I'll eat that. that'll fill me up. That's about a cup and a half of. of uh, I don't eat the hard, nothing around where the seeds are, but I eat all the rind uh -huh. and uh -huh. the red from the, where the seeds begin down. Unless it's a really young watermelon, not sweet, then I eat the whole thing. Mm. You know, and it. you have some cream with it, you said? Yeah, I'll or take probably know. three tablespoons of cream okay. before, before I add that much. In? Before you get into the hot springs? Oh, I'll do this before, before I get into the springs. And then while I'm there, I'll eat a little bit of watermelon all throughout the day. Okay. Like every hour, I'll have a half a cup. All right. Or more. And, um, uh, depending on how much I'm perspiring. Mm. Sometimes you can't tell because you're in there. I know. Well, in the mud pool, mm -hmm. it's lukewarm. You know, it's maybe 102 degrees, 101, mm -hmm. 100 degrees at the most. Yeah. It doesn't really cause perspiration, but I just get yeah. in with the mud. And then I'll go from that. I'll clean off, clean the mud, mm -hmm. and I leave it in the tub. I don't get out and shower it off. I leave it in that, that uh, pool, pool mm -hmm. so I can get it muddier. So when I go back in, it's muddy, you know, so... In fact, when I'm the first one there, when I go, used to go there, mm -hmm. I would start packing mud in that. I would start mixing it in the water while it's on me and keep oh, getting me wet. Oh, you that guy that I saw there doing that. Nah. Somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> you may have been. Who knows? So I get a lot. I get it very muddy, and then I I spend maybe an hour, an hour and a half mm -hmm. in the in the mud bath, and then I would go into the hot. Yeah, spot. I don't go. I go to Warner Springs and. Um, I like it out there a lot. The pool is sometimes 101 to 104, somewhere uh -huh. in the middle there. But I was interested in like buying maybe a place down there or renting, and somebody mentioned that, oh, there's a cancer cluster here. So I wanted to ask you, do you know how you find out? I tried to find some information out. There's two cell towers there also, and there's also a cancer cluster here in Carlsbad. So 
I mean, they're saying it's either from there's the water, soil. Everywhere. everywhere there's cancer clusters now. And, well, you know, once they give it a, I know, but there's like 15 kids, five of them died here right in Carlsbad. And you give they, a kid the vaccine the day he pops out, the kid's going to get, the kid's going to have a 60% chance of getting cancer before he's a teenager. But there's too many in one place, don't you agree? If it's a power plant or they're next to a... No, because they do a lot of experimenting. How much can they put in here? And they use How much can they put what? How much can they put what in the... How much can they put in the vaccine? How much of this? How much of that? They're screwing around. The military does it. The, our government does it. They make... They go to a certain area and they'll experiment with them. Yeah, but we got... They did it with of... one million people in Mississippi. Well, and I, the, believe the black that. I believe that. They, I believe they that. They destroyed. They did that with the retarded people. kids in New York. They used yeah. them as guinea pigs. And they're doing yeah. it all the time. But you, so you're saying if you live next to a power plant, or if you live next to well, the military. If you're living there next too, to a power right? plant, you're going to have you're risking you're creating a higher risk of course. Right. Right. If you live near a power tower. You're going to take a risk. I know, and now these damn cell tower things—they're everywhere. Everywhere. And antenna, yeah. every, no, they're popping up more and more. I mean, I know. you cannot go down, you know, 94 or here. They're everywhere, and I don't know. A lot of people are saying that, you know, their the frequencies are just too much for our bodies to. They are. If you're not healthy, yeah, they are. Okay. So you have to go on the raw food diet to get help. Yep. Exactly. Just to sustain. Because well, we're already so uh, damn toxic. Yeah, we're already toxic. You know? Definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, you look at Lisa. She's there. She's young still, but she's coming from what she came from. Toxic she's background. Been, I know, but relatively fairly good, and she still has a lot of shit in her system. You know? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Do you have a question, Michael? Uh, the, um, I think my doctor's concerned about a uh, elevated homo Christine level. Homocysteine. Homocysteine level. And, uh, That's more drug selling. <laughs> you have homocysteines are created to take care of toxins. So it shows that you have a high toxic level. Whenever you have an allergy to something, uh, something can harm something in the body. Your body will build homocysteines to resist and handle it. That's a good thing. It's like bacteria is a, you know, a janitor. That's a kind of a janitor. So it shows, yes, you have toxins in your body that are moving, and your body's building a lot of homocysteine to deal with that so you don't get sick, and so you remove it properly. It is a sign that you've got a problem, but not a problem to lower it, and that's what they do. Just remember, the doctors don't make money if you're well. So ignore it? Ignore it. Completely ignore it. After chemotherapy, my homocysteine level was off the chart. The body's trying to and my, my nutritionist body. said ignore it. Your it's your body working against as an allergy to something in the body. And it is not the raw food. It is something already in the body that's toxic. What is homocysteine? Homocysteine is a protein... Uh, a hormonal protein substance that helps bind with certain kinds of toxins. Because I know, uh, I read an article about people or men who have, a, say, irregular heartbeat and stuff like that should have homocysteine tests. But I don't know if it should be high or low. Well, they're looking for a low homocysteine. Which is supposed to be... If you have a high homocysteine, it shows you have a lot of toxins moving through the body at a particular time. And that can cause the heartbeat to increase and be irregular. That does not mean the homocysteine is causing it. No, the toxins causing it. The homocysteine will keep you from having a heart attack. You take the homocysteine out, and you're going to have a heart attack if that toxin is free to move on its own, and it beds in the heart. You end up with a Charlie horse. So. You have to find out how to regulate that. No, you just leave your body alone, eat properly. Eat properly. Your okay. body will always seek a proper level if you're eating properly. Unless, let's say, you got you drank half a cup of arsenic. All the homocysteine in the world isn't going to prevent it. You remember that guy back in the 1800, late 1800s, that put out, uh, you know, that he's going to drink a half a cup of arsenic, 
and he publicized it, what was it, six to 12 months ahead of time, yeah. all over the world. So they had reporters from London, everywhere, go to where this guy, I mean, Paris, Brussels, everywhere in the world, they went to see this guy, and he said, I am not going to choose the, uh, the, um, uh, the poison, uh, let the, you know, let a university doctor, you know, bring the arsenic, half a cup of arsenic, and I will drink it in front of everybody, and I'll show you that I live. So he got people all the way, he made a fortune off of it, and he drank a half a cup of arsenic. And until he died in the 1930s, he did not tell anybody how he did it. And on his deathbed, he said, I drank a half a cup of clay an hour before. <laughs> and it, the clay, the arsenic Ooh, went in, the clay absorbed it just like that. Wow. So you have a high histamine, eat some clay. Let the clay help you. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, your body doesn't have to make the homocysteines so much. So what do you think of those basic tests that they tell you, like Dr. Oz and everybody on TV yeah. says, go ahead and get, um, I mean, like C-reactive protein as, as far as inflammation what in the body. What do they sell? What are they selling? I don't know what he's selling. Well, They're he's selling a, something. That's what MD. it's all about. He's for money. He's an MD, yeah. so I mean, you know, I mean, he's and he's one of the good ones. You know what I'm saying? They think <laughs> that no, he the thinks right he's thing. a good guy. I saw Doctor no? pushing the flu vaccine. Oh well, I know that. No. Yeah, I know. He's not all he's there. He's a yeah. he's got a big show. To me, they don't know better. He's a. They don't he's, know. He's, well, they know. Medically they trained. Know. Oh, know. they know. When you've been a doctor for ten years, you well, know a, what's he's happening. A to you. He's a cardiologist. It doesn't make any difference. When you see people getting worse instead of better every time you treat them, that's a bad sign. That's why now they don't make you swear in the Bible or anything when they take the Hippocratic oath. <laughs> oh wow! You just stand there and you take it. No raising of the hand or anything. You just. Repeat it. And that's it. Say it aloud. There's no swearing. You know, I mentioned that to a doctor. He said, "Well, I didn't swear on it. Uh, you know, if I swore on that, I couldn't use any medication, any medicine." You know, the guy admitted it. You know, so they know what they're doing. If they're ten years into the business, they know what they're doing, and that includes their uh, once they get out of. Uh, Pre-med, I mean, their internship in a hospital, they pretty much know, know that they're the bad guys. And that's why people like Dr. Weil go away from this. Absolutely. But they still carry all that yeah. fear and training with them. They don't get out of it. Yeah. They're still they don't trust the body. They've got to do something to help the body. And they don't know they're asking them a hole in the ground. Deepak Chopra, is he a doctor? No. Yeah, he's an MD. Yeah. He's kind of more... Away from the, the well, he's into, you know, he's still into antibiotics, but he's more into prayer. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you know, not doing something about it more favorable. <coughs> he's into mind over matter right, yeah. more. So, yes, question? Yes, no? I'm not sure yet. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. Do you have a question? Uh, you know, uh, well, so, um, what more could I take to like help brain function, you know, like somebody uh, working from the computer thing and I don't know uh, you got a flat screen? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. But even so I, I I still find myself, you know, trying to reduce my time in front of the thing. Uh, um, well do you have do you have a tower or do you have a laptop? No, I have a laptop. Pardon? I have a laptop. Do you have a separate keyboard? Uh no. Okay. The EMF, you take an EMF meter and you put it over your computer, what model do you have? I have a uh, MacBook Pro. You have a Mac Pro? Yeah. Okay, so you're putting off right around 170 milligauss of electromagnetic field. That going up your hand into your brain all day long is going to dull your brain. So you need a separate keyboard and you keep the computer 9 to 10 inches away the bottom of the computer has to be 9 to 10 inches away from the top of the keyboard to not be in that field. When I first got a keyboard, I mean, I first got a laptop, I moved into a new house, uh, not a new house, but a house at the same time, 
and I started having all of my bone problems that I, you know, when I had leukemia and uh, and uh, bone cancer, multiple myeloma, and I thought I was getting it back. And when I went away on a trip, um, all of it went away, and I didn't take my computer with me. And I still thought of maybe it was the house. I didn't know what it was, and I still didn't put it together. Called in an environmental specialist to you know check for radon, anything in the house. Only thing he found was a high EMF field coming off of my laptop computer. He said, "Get a separate keyboard." Got a separate keyboard. I mean, I went out that day. I not only, I didn't let him out of the house. I made him sell me his equipment. Mm -hmm. So I never had to call another guy again because <laughs> I'd be <laughs> testing everything after that. So I did. It took me an hour to talk him out of his equipment because <laughs> that'd be another week before he could get them made and stuff. So anyway, I got them, and uh, I got the separate keyboard, and sure enough, all the pain went right away within 24 hours. So that's probably a lot of it, but if you want to stimulate your brain. I was going to say, besides, besides the blueberries and cream, what else can I eat? Uh, asparagus tips and juice the stalks. You need about two to three inches of the asparagus tip and then juice the rest of the stalk. Now your pea is going to smell very strange, but disregard that. Now, what a lot of people do in India to increase brain function is they'll eat the asparagus like that and juice it, and then drink their urine uh, after they have some kind of milk. You know, when they urinate, after they have, they have milk. We can do it after meat or anything like that. And those particular proteins recycle that are more, uh, that do the particular union that stimulates the brain. So you may get a, let's say, from eating the asparagus and asparagus juice, you'll probably get a 20%, 18 to 20%, 15 to 20% increase in brain alertness, focus. However, you drink your urine uh, one time, uh, about six hours following uh, having the asparagus, as long as you've eaten a meat meal or had some milk or eggs, then you will increase it like 20% to 27% brain function. So, if you're really looking to stimulate you know, the how brain. How much you drink? Uh, well, it depends on how much you urinate. Uh, um, probably when I've experimented with it, half a cup was enough. Three quarters of a cup didn't change it much, just a little bit. Cup didn't change anything from three quarters of a cup. So half a cup to three quarters of a cup. When the laptop is shut off, is it still giving you that EMF? That it's it's shut when you no, shut down. No, it's, it's not on. It's oh, no. It's, okay. What about wireless systems? You know, a wireless net. Uh, wireless. <laughs> wireless net uh, access. Oh, and very bad. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely, if you have a laptop, you want to keep that laptop. You know, like when I use it. And I'll go to a hotel, and that's all that I have. My laptop's here, and I'm over here. I have good vision, long, long sight vision, so I can read that far. It, but I've got it three feet from me. Are we talking about routers? No. Yeah, routers, routers, the same thing, yeah. Routers, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Wireless, Wi-Fi. Yes. Yeah. The mouse, it has to be a rollerball, and the only company that makes a rollerball mouse is Bell. The, uh, the infrared, 75 milligals minimum in your hand. I got with my laptop that I, uh, that I got three years ago, my uh, Ferrari's Acer, had a mouse to match everything with the, you know, the Ferrari emblem on it, so it looked really black and red you know, really neat looking. And I used that for about three hours and my arm and hand were aching. I'm really sensitive because of all the radiation therapy that I had. And I took, I couldn't believe it. Here's, you've got an infrared and it's got a high electromagnetic field. It didn't make any sense at all, but it was high. So I got my old roller ball out. Next day, no problem. Do they still sell them? Bill? Yeah, Dell is the only one that no, makes them themselves. Dell or Dell? D-E-L-L. -L. And they have the mouse? They have the rollerball mouse. Okay. Well, then, with the
Mac, uh, you need an adapter for the mouse because it's a uh, USB. Uh -huh. It's a different uh, connection to a PC mouse. So you need a separate adapter to use the mobile mouse on the Mac. You're going to have to find uh, an adapter. Good. Okay, uh, do you have a question? I do. Uh, a couple things. Um, stiffness, like in my joints, and then my legs uh -huh. are getting like stiff. I've never had that before. So, Called aging. smoothies, <laughs> lactic acid, <laughs> <laughs> hot trash. <Hot. laughs> like, <laughs> That's, those are toxins building up in the joints for so many years, and that's what happens. That's what, when they need your aging, you're building up toxins over the years. And there's a lots of things that live in the joints because, uh, especially as thin as you were when I met you, I mean, you were thin. Yeah, I was. Uh, your body seeks the place where there's fat. That was the brain and the bone marrow. It's the only place where there's heavy fat. So your bone marrow gets filled with all these poisons. When it discards, where does it leave? The joints. All the joints cause arthritis and rheumatism. Also, if you had a digestive problem, like Crohn's disease, and you had leaky gut, those particles of food go to the joints, and the body builds the acids there to become a digestive tract and starts eating the joints away. You're, that's what arthritis and rheumatism. Ninety percent of arthritis and rheumatism comes from leaky gut. So, more smoothies, hot baths. Not no, more baths, heat at night, hot water bottles on the joints bottles? to help okay. more circulation in those areas to hot clean it. Okay. More nutrients in an area means more detoxification and uh, and more healing. Okay. And. Um, I'm, clay I'm, is helpful. Clay. Usually a lot of metals because of the, clay. when you get a vaccine, probably in most people, 70% of it will go to the stomach lining and 30% will go to the bone marrow. So, so clay, you like, it put it on the skin. eat it. Just clay in, in milk? How much? Put some clay yeah. in some milk? Uh, you make the soft, like I said in the recipe book, <laughs> you make the moist clay. Use like <clears throat> three quarters of a cup of clay and three quarters of a cup of water. So you've got a cup and a half made. Let it sit for four to five days to get everything, the bacteria and the microorganisms going. Clay is the only shape shifter that we know. The organisms in it are shape shifters, just like stem cells. They can take on the makeup of whoever the body wants them to, to make up. So. Clay is the only substance we eat that does that besides bone marrow, clay and bone marrow. But the clay is not really digestible. It helps you digest. It helps bring soil bacteria in. But it draws out poisons galore. Okay. So it adds nutrients to your blood, your lymph, your neurological fluids to help you pull out these toxins out of the body. And you have to so you take like a tablespoon of that soft liquid I clay and then you put it into two to four ounces of milk. You can blend it or stir it. it tastes a little like chocolate milk if you're using Terramin clay and you drink that. And if you don't like the gritty taste in your mouth, you can follow it with a you know, a swallow of milk and flush it in your mouth so you don't have all that gritty is in there. Yeah, pick up the so I tried a quarter of a teaspoon in some milk to dissolve, and it wouldn't in dissolve. Bowling hills. You know, just oh. stirring it with a spoon. You're taking it dry? No, no. It was wet, well, I, moist, I it. moist, and moist. you need to blend it. One second. Just like so. real quick in no, the food and then follow it. No, you need to mix it around milk. because really? if it gets into the blood, you want a lot of calcium and phosphorus and magnesium and potassium with it. To bind with the poisons. But can you like just maybe swallow your milk real fast? I'm bathing it. Or have a teaspoon of it? No. If you can't mix it here, what makes you think it's going to mix in the stomach? For a bath. You need to disperse it. Otherwise, it's just going to. Yeah. The reason I don't like is a lot of people in autopsies and people who clay. I've seen clay impactation. That's a trick. You know, let it settle. Places were dried up into their intestine and just stayed there.
Oh. Stayed there. That meant yeah, that whole area we'll of that intestine didn't function. Pipes, but, uh, so you don't recommend using <laughs> clay regularly? Is that what you yes, but, but I'm saying you it blend it with milk. Oh, okay, that way. Mix it in a fluid so it thins so it. So it doesn't clump. Right, okay. so it doesn't clump. Okay. Does it matter if the milk is cold? Of course. We always got to be room ready. temperature. Yeah. Um, Plasogenous, like getting something. Underneath in my armpits, and I think it's more gallons. It's like it, it gets like a rash, and it's very itchy, and it's I, it's Are just there fibers weird. In it? It's just weird. I haven't noticed any kind of fibers. Then it's not more gallons. No. No. You just gotta just remember, 90% of toxins leave through the skin. You're always going to get eruptions anytime you're detoxifying. And even if it's really itchy, huh? Itchy yeah. just means that the poison is so toxic that it's robbed the fats out of the surrounding cells. So they're drying up and that's the itch. Okay. So you put the primal facial body care cream on or some bone marrow or butter. Okay. okay. Defend the cells. Make sure the cells have enough fat to be pulled from when the toxin comes through. Because if there's not enough fat and the only fat that that cell has is inside of itself, if it gives it up, it's going to dry out just like you would. But there's no cure for more, more gallons or more gallons, whatever. Well, clay it, helps. It helps. Yeah. It doesn't really cure. Well, I got it from these three injections, you know, so I had fibers and little insects coming out of my skin like crazy. When, when do they come out? When would you see those? Uh, it was about probably a week after I got injected. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. wow. Can you explain the more gallons? Yeah, I never heard of that. More gallons? What do you um, mean? It's a... It's scary. It's a, uh, it's a, a condition where the body's detoxing through the skin, fibers with insects attached. Now, well, the military has been using this as a war tool since about the ni late 1950s. They put, uh, like, fly eggs and they embed them in these fibers. So they go around spraying them in the air. They disperse them somehow in the air. It's mostly from aerial spraying. And people inhale these. The fiber gets absorbed into the tissue. The egg hatches. So you've got a live fly that's a tiny little microscopic fly living on. And it, for some reason, it's like legs are entwined in the fibers and it can't get loose. So it does tremendous damage as it comes to the skin. So, it, I mean, all of these scars that you see on here, all of these were from that occurrence. And I've got some big ones. These here, like bullet holes. You can see these here. Actually see them? Oh, we actually see all of them. Yeah, definitely. Look at them under a microscope. There are lots of them from that, those wow. three injections. Like a scab. Like a scab. Yeah, well, it doesn't come out like a scab at first. It comes out like a very inflamed sore. So now you're completely over it? Uh, yeah, I don't have it. Well, I'll get a breakout maybe once every two months. They'll start coming out. You can see all these. I have thousands of them all over my body. So I've got all these tiny little scars. At first, they weren't tiny. They were big like this one. But this was, see this size right here? Yeah. This was five times bigger than that a year ago Wow. when it came out. This little one here was five times that size last year. Wow. So they're shrinking little by little. These over here were even larger. So just just your your diet alone care of is just yeah, right. doing it. Of course, I ate more clay than I'd ever done before. Oh, a lot of clay? A lot of clay. Oh, okay. Like more than a tablespoon a day? Yeah, sometimes I had three tablespoons a day. Break it up, four ounces of milk, tablespoon of, of, uh, uh, of the clay three times daily. And what else did you do, Andres? Because you look so much better from last time when I saw you. Just I'm just eating more clay. Just more yeah, clay. More clay. How much are you still Pardon? How much are you still eating? Well, it's not consistent. I'll go, when I feel my body starting to detox, and I get very nauseous, and I don't want to go through days of vomiting, mm -hmm. I'll have three tablespoons daily. Where does Sometimes clay? four. And you can use the term Yeah, always. Where did the clay come from? Uh, it's near the Mojave Desert. It was an old, uh, old uh, aqua bed, um, a mineral spring, a hot mineral spring. And they mine it 
where it's only come out of the ground no more than 98 degrees. So all the phosphorus is intact. Everything's intact. Could you put it on a stall like a boil or something? Yeah, absolutely. But put it on wet. Don't they put don't it on dry. They don't put it in the stores, though. You pardon? It's what you say. We need to buy it through. Yeah, I'll go online. California clay, whatever it is. We go to Terraman.com. Terraman.com. T e r r a m i n. It's probably, probably eight miles away. They're in the desert, off away, yeah. Somebody's just trying to, because Terraman clay is such a good clay. It's the best one I've ever experimented with and tried. People are going to Terraman more and more and more, and all these other companies are losing, so they're coming up with stories. Is clay something that would be beneficial for anyone to be using on a regular basis? As day? long as you're, uh, you've been up, uh, you grew up on the sad diet. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can raise your hand to that. <laughs> Anybody here not raised on the sad diet? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, my question is that I'm experiencing a lot. Oh, wait a minute. She's new to California. We don't answer questions for non california <laughs> <laughs> She's from Colorado. Welcome her. Son. I'm from Colorado. I was born in Denver. Oh, you are? Um, I'm experiencing a lot of like what I would call dry eye. It doesn't hurt or anything. But it's just really, really dry. And I don't know if that um, seems like ever since I had that diagnosis of the RA that that maybe that's been <coughs> still happening. But see how dry your skin is on your face. <coughs> that's how dry you are in your head. And that's, of course, you're going to leach fats and water from your eyes. They're going to be deficient. Okay. The only way you can do that is you have to put lots of, you know, like primal facial body care cream on your face daily. Okay. And you put honey and butter in your mouth frequently and just keep rolling it around. If you taste a toxic taste when you're rolling around, spit it out, get rid of those poisons, put some fresh stuff in. Okay, so honey and butter, not honey and cheese. No, honey and cheese will dry. Uh, okay. Honey and butter. All right, honey and butter and, and coconut cream on my face and the uh, other facial cream. That the primal facial body care cream. Oh, and I'm primal facial body care cream, uh, it's new and improved. Oh. Instead of using one-third uh, cream, uh, butter, and dairy cream, uh, coconut cream, butter, and dairy cream, you still use those, but now you cut them down to a fourth of the ingredients and add bone marrow. So it's a quarter bone marrow now. Where do you get the bone marrow? Uh, I get it from North Star Bison. Oh, uh, you know, you can get a delivery when you, when Cynthia, when you buy her, get her stuff, she gets it from uh, um, Rawson in Los Angeles. So you can order it through her. Or you order it direct from uh, North Star Bison. And you get it popped out of the, the bone already, half the price. Oh, they have it without the bone? Yeah. Yeah. They'll sell it without the bone. Oh, yeah. You said Alicia should take that if she would? Yeah. How would she take that? Just eat it. With a meat meal or just anything? With a meat meal is always better before a meat meal is always better. And how much does she have? Uh, at least one of those bones a day. Well, I'm in town. I eat a whole package. I eat five to seven bones worth a day. Oh, so I'm eating you? like, uh, you know, about uh, half of a cup of bone marrow. If even more, three quarters of a cup if you press it down. You know, so half to three quarters of a cup of bone marrow I eat a day because I'm not in town much <laughs> and I can't get it all the time. So when I'm here, I power up on it. What's it called, Doctor? Is it bone? Is it bone marrow without the bone? Yeah, bone said. marrow without the bone. You mentioned before that she vaccinates the female bison. Do you have the special? This is the breeding ones, ones that Would breed you offspring. With the bone marrow, do you have to make a special request not to get the? She, she, I tell everybody that, and she shot me an email about a month ago saying, 
I do not I do not sell any of the bones or any of the meat, any of the product for my breeding females. When they die, I ship them off to the to the dump, you know, for, to the bear, which means it goes to, you know, dog food or something like that. So, so it saying, goes off for waste. So it's not for human organs, consumption. Glands, anything yeah, that's what she says. Yeah. Okay, do you have a question? A lot of them. <laughs> well, I have dark around here, and I thought it was from the glaucoma drops, uh -huh. but the nutritionist that I've talked to, he said my liver and kidneys are stressed. Well, the darkest sign of liver. Yeah. Uh, if you had puffy eyes, it would be a sign of kidney problems, too. Oh. But you don't have puffy eyes. Oh. You have darkness. That shows some liver difficulties. Well, of course, but uh, but I wouldn't do anything special. Just go into my book and okay. look up liver, because okay. there's quite a few things you can do about the liver. Okay. Um, also, with yours, with your eyes, egg white in your eyes, butter in your eyes, also. Butter too. Huh? Well, what you do is a little dab of either egg white or butter, and you pull the side down and you put it along the white. And then you hold both up and you roll it around like your circus master. Moisturizing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that soothes the eyes. In fact, it restores vision in a lot of circumstances. Well, that's what I want. That was the other piece I wanted to ask you about vision, because I had LASIK surgery, but now I just use these for sort of reading or computer or uh -huh. whatever, and I'm feeling like these are 200s. I need to get something a little stronger. And it's so, so to help. That I well, I've, I used to just say egg white, and then I had a patient who had Coke bottle thick glasses, and she was determined, you know, because I got her excited on the diet, and everything was working for her better, and she was a, a rich girl. I mean, this girl, $100 million when she was 20 years old, so she doesn't have to think about a thing, so she can play with anything. So she doesn't have to work, so she sits at home doing all these different things, experimenting. <laughs> So she was putting butter in her eyes twice daily. Her prescription would cut in half in seven months. Wow. Yeah, so wow. I was impressed. Wow. How about Plus she was on the PD? Was she on the, on the diet? On the diet, absolutely, also. completely, 100%. Wow. Yeah. Did, that, did that help the, the pressure of your eye or anything like it that? It can help anything. Yeah. The raw certified butter. Yeah, no salt. But you said honey with cheese can make the toxins reabsorb, though, correct? You shouldn't have honey with cheese. Unless it's after a meat meal and you want to absorb the, the you want to, that cheese to be your mineral supplement. So after a meat meal, about 35 minutes after a meat meal, you eat cheese and honey together twice daily for a mineral supplement. All the other times you eat it without honey to absorb poison. The only thing that I have found, though, is that if I eat cheese... Second. So loud. Okay. You said when you eat cheese, eat butter with it because it's constipated. Some people, yes. Well, to me, I found that very... Uh, no matter how much uh, butter I eat with it, it's constipation. <laughs> and I eat plenty of butter with it. Well, if you're getting constipated that way, you just don't have enough fat in your bowel. The E. coli are going to hold it up. See, because a cheese is already a moldy substance, at least our cheese that we get, uh, because it's it's grown in a cave. And that's the way you have a fungus that breaks down the cheese. It's like a yogurt, only a fungus instead of a bacteria is breaking down your cheese so we digest it. So the fungus breaks it down. So the E. coli can get even more nutrients from it. So it's going to hold it up there longer. It doesn't dry you out more if you're eating butter with it. However, your bowel is so, your E. coli and your bowel are so hungry that you need to feed it from the back end. And I told you this before. You have three tablespoons each of coconut cream, butter, and dairy cream. And shove it up in there. Leave it there. Yeah, and but you that, that and drops out. And it got, got out all over my car seat. I think I told you that. And you have to wear a diaper, really. No, you do it at night before you go to sleep. But it doesn't come out the whole day. 
I've never had it come out on anybody but you. And that's the wildest thing. But don't put half that much then. Don't put so much in. Put half of that amount in. <laughs> and did you also get on your left side and roll, or did you get down? You bark. <laughs> <laughs> and then after you get it in, you go down like this, and you roll your stomach. So move down your it's your colon, so it won't stay in the sigmoid area. And then you can lie like this, roll your stomach a little bit to get it move up here, and then you can roll like this and go over here to get it move over more, so you can feed the E. coli everywhere. So that's what you can do to prevent it from, you know, dumping. Because this sounds like yours is just staying in the sigmoid colon. If it's doing that, you need to work it up higher. Are you doing that for? Pardon? How long would you do that for on the ground? Three minutes. Yeah. Whole thing would take three minutes. If you really want to get all the good fat over, you know, to the whole colon, so make sure every bit of it gets then I would do it for about 10 minutes, probably three minutes, like this, rolling the stomach, then the left side for about three minutes, then the right side for about three minutes. I have one question. You got your, uh, back there. This is our host. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Can <laughs> you your questions help me? Um, I'm just curious about, we were talking earlier with the ladies about gaining weight and losing weight. And I could be on the same amount of food on the diet, and when I was very sick, I lost rapid weight, like 30 right. pounds. And then when I started to feel better, I gained the weight back without really trying. Does your body just find its own balance? Yes, that's what it wants to do. It will always like be... Fat or lose weight or <coughs> yeah, it does. I prefer you do it on its own. <coughs> but in the recipe book, I said a six-month period, because a lot of people are afraid <coughs> that if they gain the weight, they're never going to lose it. It's usually a two and a half year cycle. Yeah, because what else they gain the weight back? Yeah. Like, and if more? yeah, because most most of the time people will gain the weight, keep it for two and a half years, then their body will go through a detoxification, oh. knock it off, and then grow it back. And you know, I stopped putting it on heavily again. So you know, I'm kind of yeah. I'm, well. So I think it's yeah. But you've been on it 40 years. No, I've been on. Raw meat on a daily basis since February of 80, I mean December of 82. So that's when I count that I went on a good diet. When I started eating meat twice daily on a daily basis. Before that, I was just eating meat three days a week. One meal of, so three pounds of meat a week maximum. Now I eat a pound a day. And if I don't eat a pound of meat a day, I eat 50 eggs. And you don't work out at all? No. I eat up to 50 eggs. Not a day. Yeah. A day? Yeah. I've eaten up to 50 eggs a day. Yeah. Done it many times. No, Let's say 100 for, times. Is that for protein and mineralization? Is that why you eat so many eggs? No, because eggs are already liquid. So there's very little digestion involved. So if I want to get strong and healthy fast, I'll eat a lot of eggs. Wow. And eat bone marrow along with it. You know, like I may have, you have uh, three pieces three sections of bone marrow in a day, because eggs don't have the ability to increase cellular division like meat will. Uh, refrigerated milk is the same way. So I eat the bone marrow with it so that I will regenerate cells fast as well as strengthening the body. Like the example I used in the rest of your book, the woman with emphysema who was supposed to die that weekend. Right, she had 33 okay. eggs on Saturday, 33 on Sunday. She was out of the bed and off the machines on Monday morning. Only eggs could ever do that. So I know the value of eggs. And they weren't organic though, huh? You didn't mention that one, with just regular eggs? They weren't regular eggs. I told the, her doctor oh. to get them, you know, at least at, at a health food store. Oh. You know, and I said, you know, ones that are cage-free, not... Uh, you know, not uh, the organic in a cage right. animals. So hmm. that's what you got. They weren't the best eggs, I'm sure. Can you get, and she got results, can you get um, similar results by like putting half a dozen eggs in a smoothie or a milkshake? No? No, you can put on lots of weight that way. <laughs> no, once, see, it takes milk six to ten hours to digest. So 
once you put it into the milk, it slows everything down. I make sure I digest it within 27 minutes because I will break the egg and I suck out the egg white. You know, I dent the end without putting a hole in it, the fat in, the fatter in. And then the narrow end, I'll punch the hole in it and I'll have to hold it down like this and I'll suck it gently. Only the egg white comes out first. And then the egg white digests very rapidly because it isn't fat. You don't have to have the bile. It takes longer for the bile to work on it. We don't need any hydrochloric acid for the egg white because it's already liquid. All we need to do is the bacteria working. So I keep the egg white in my mouth until it's completely water. And I know it's full of bacteria. And then I swallow it. And then the egg yolk will last. And of course, the, your body kind of layers things. As it goes in, it kind of layers itself. So it moves that way. Um, so the yolk comes in behind, and the yolk will digest much faster by itself, too, as well as the egg white will. So Is it you, okay to leave the umbilical cord out of that? Can you not eat that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. It's just good protein. I know, I just can't yeah, That's probably that the only thing in it that has stem cells, and you want to get rid of it. But that's okay. <laughs> I'll take them. You collect them and send them to me. <laughs> 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 How did you make it weight loss, rapid weight loss from eggs? Yes, you can. So, you can. If you only eat eggs, if you eat milkshakes, no. But if you eat only eggs, you're going to get very young, and then you might get a little irritable. When you so, eat eggs, you like when you're only doing you're eggs, eggs, you're also going to feel very dehydrated. Yeah. So, you know, need to keep you know a little bit of butter in your mouth, mm -hmm. throwing honey butter on your lips, or just honey. So, the relationship to the is it better not to force the down diet and just let your body do it? It's always better to let your body do it. Do you just stay on the dairy all the time and then all of a sudden it'll lose weight or do you just choose to stop doing the Your dairy? body will stop you from eating for a while and it's detox it's heavily. Not hungry, so like not when you start getting nauseous and your body says, wait a minute, every time you put anything into it, you'll vomit. That's when the body is saying, <laughs> no, nope, we're going to do something differently here. No force down Don't need to. to. Do that one. Yeah. Why did you used to do that down diet? Like I said, that was for people who were paranoid that they'd never lose the weight. Uh -huh. So if they did it for a year on and off, they could say, oh, I can lose that weight. And they get used to it. Yeah, and off. then they don't, then they aren't as particular yeah. about it. Oh, I can lose that weight later. Oh, I can use that. And that's what I like, them to postpone it, <laughs> let their bodies do it. You know, people are very lazy when it comes to you know, anything that takes work. stress and work. Yeah. And if the body wants that fat, you're not going to get rid of it easily. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's not going to, it's not going to let you, you, work out. you have to work it. You have to work out, you have to limit what you eat. You have to do like the, the in the book, in the recipe book, I have a weight loss program. Yeah, I read so that. they're eating frequently, but small amounts. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and that's the only way you can get the body to agree to it. I'm getting it right here. And that's where you need it. Ugh. Where do a lot of the toxins go? So what if the makes you hold fat? Is there, you know, because regular nutrition says, oh, my insulin factor and all this stuff. But that's all their bullshit what to get you to take supplements. Right. So what actually keeps, what actually signals your body to hold the fat? Your body is holding fats everywhere in the body because you have toxins in all the tissues, all the cells. Mm -hmm. The body wants to draw those poisons out or if they're moving out on their own, you have the fat there to arrest it right away. It won't do any damage. It's holding it for food. Is it fat or for calories? Uh, is it for fat that actually is fat that you're eating, or is it for calories or meat also? If you're not eating butter with your meat, your body will make uh, fats from the protein. But if you're eating fats with your meat, it's not going to use the meat that way. Right. And if you're eating enough fat, your body won't convert any fruits unless you're eating, you know, a quart of blueberries a day. Then your body won't make fat with it. Right. Even if you're eating a lot of fat, it will do that. Your body wants to hold it if you have toxins in your in your tissues. That's why I like everybody to be fat if they're sick. You'll have protection. If you don't have protection, what's going to happen when those toxins get free? They're going to do more damage. Can you imagine internally, like you had the 
toxin come out and dry out the skin and cause the itching. Mm -hmm. It'll do that internally. And you can't scratch it. <laughs> and you can't apply butter on it directly. You're going to have to eat a ton of butter to get there. Or, a, you know, a, a, a lubrication moisturizing formula. And a lot of it to get there. But you're lean now. You're eating as much as you used to. I'm still 18% body fat. 18% body fat. I look 7 to 10%. Remember, when you've been on the diet, I've not eaten cooked fats since, since 1974. So every fat molecule in my body is tiny and concentrated. When you cook a fat, it swells 1 to 50 times its normal size. So you've got a lot of old, swollen fat in your body. It's coming out even though I lost weight? Yep. So deeper from the Yeah, in your bones, everywhere. Bones. Everywhere. It takes 40 years to get rid of all of it. I still have 12 years to go. <laughs> What's the ideal body fat for a man or a woman? For a, for a man, it should be about 22% until they get healthy. Then they can get down to 17, 18% like I am. And then a uh, woman should be anywhere from uh, 26 to 30. Oh my God. What's the lowest you go to when you reduce? You had mentioned when you were in the Philippines when you got the shot. You the lowest I got to was 16% body fat. Oh, so you're pretty slim then. No, oh, I was very slimmer very than now. Let me tell you, I lost 40 pounds that trip. And you were still... I was vomiting. I was diarrhea, breaking out, oozing all over the place. You were still 16% body Pardon? fat. You were still 16% body fat. If I, I might have been dead if I had been less than, less than that. Gosh. Are we going to experience that? The vomiting and the diarrhea and the vomiting? Everybody does sometimes. And the yeah. oozing we're going to do? Oh, that. well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> some people do. Some people really? do. Yes. Yeah, some people do. Oh, so does the woman go from 26 to 30? What do they go to if they're healthy? Uh, usually about 22%. Just think if you're so, not. I'm sorry. Oh, well, I was just going to want to finish it. So if I have mine, like 19 something. So that's bad? That's not good. I think that every woman should be at least absolute minimum 24%. That's so tiny, though. That's the absolute least. But I think all women should be 27 to 30. How do you know what your body is? Uh, there are different ways to tell. The absolute perfect way is you immerse yourself in a swimming pool that has a certain electromagnetic field that reads it. Uh, the, within 1 to 2 percent, there are scales. You put your weight in your height and you get up on it, and it has a way of measuring your body fat. That's what I use mainly. Float or sink. It has nothing to do with weight, not what you weigh. Well, oh. it, that, it figures it out. It's a calculus formula, okay. but I'm not going to go into that. No. Okay. Can I ask my question on almonds yet or not? Uh, let me see. Did I get everybody one time? No. You didn't have a question yet? I you don't want one? Everything. He knows everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I did have a question about um, I'm not interested in the question the year thing. I wondered if uh, I've heard that before about the benefits of, I mean, I don't know the details, right. but I'm wondering, like the clay, does it have a detoxifying effect on the body as well? And well, so no, it's mainly a recycling. It does have one element that's for detoxification, that's the ammonia. Mm -hmm. uh, ammonia is a good detoxifier, like after I got those forced injections. Um, I went for shark and I couldn't because it's high in ammonia. Every day that a shark has been killed, it doubles in ammonia. Stingray does the same thing, so I found a stingray. So I ate stingray for 24 hours. It was so much ammonia, that stingray was probably a day old already. And I had it, by the time I finished it, it was 36 hours old. So I was hallucinating, I was passing out, I was short of breath. I had all kinds of problems from too much ammonia. Too much ammonia can kill you. But I needed to bind with those poisons quickly. So I used ammonia for that purpose, to bind with toxic metals and substances that were foreign to the body. So I used it in that way. And when you're having urine, you have a little bit of ammonia in it. 
so it can help detoxify. But mainly, you're recycling all of your fats, proteins, and all the rich nutrients that are in the blood. Because the urine is nothing other than the blood, everything that's in the blood, without all the red and white blood cells. So how do you get to that point of drinking them? Uh, I did it when I was a vegetarian, and I had to recycle my proteins because I got too getting skinnier and skinnier. I was almost evaporated. Mm -hmm. So then somebody told me about you know India. Mm -hmm. They drink milk, but they're vegetarians basically, mm -hmm. and they drink their urine at least once a day to recycle those proteins that they don't get eat. eat uh, they don't get because they don't eat meat. I thought urine was very toxic, though. I thought it was. It's only as toxic as your your diet. But see, if we're we have a fat diet, then it's we're toxic. pretty toxic. So Absolutely. if we drank our urine, wouldn't that be counterproductive? For some people, it isn't. They don't get any protein unless they have it that way. In India, vegetarians, even though they're on cooked diets, at least the proteins will be recycled and utilized. I wouldn't do it if I were a cooked food eater. Mm -mm. I vomit from regular food anyway, so <laughs> I mean cooked food. So I can imagine what would happen if I drank my urine, you know, recycled the cooked food product. Wow. Who knows what would happen? Yeah. Okay, now you can have that question. I understand all the almonds in California are pasteurized, even the organic raw. There's no way you can get. Almonds that aren't? Well, there's only one place that I know of, and that's uh, our organic pastures. The, the, our milk producers in this, our main milk producer in the state, he has almonds and he refuses to pasteurize his. They sell those locally at Cream of the Crop, those almonds. Not the ones that are organic raw. They told me it, it, it says on there something, but then he, they told me the law is in California. They have to be passed. Yeah, but he doesn't do it to his. Maybe the ones he sells to a regular market, oh. mm -hmm. he'll go through processing, but give him a call and see. And then there's the ones from Italy, but they're probably not pasteurized. Uh, if they're allowed in the California, oh. they have to be pasteurized. Okay, organic. California doesn't want you healthy. <laughs> Well, we know that. Yes. Um, what if one wants to bodybuild to just produce more like muscle and stuff? Uh, cheese, butter, and cream. I mean, cheese, butter, and honey helps put on weight fast, muscle weight. Okay. Um, like I started eating a lot more um, cheese, honey, and butter So because I, I don't want to work out. <laughs> so then I started like putting on a lot more muscle because I got really skinny. You know, last year. So cheesecake, basically. Yeah, cheesecake. But I enjoy, I get tired of cheesecake because it's exactly the same taste every mouthful. But when you, sometimes the, the honey goes in first and then, <laughs> and then you get to mix them in your mouth. So it's a whole different, you know, it's a smorgasbord of flavors. <laughs> but if you don't have time, then it's better to have the cheesecake and just grab it and eat it. I had a question about those live blood tests. Are you finished? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what time is it? 5.30. 5.30. got to stop. I'm way past. I've got patients waiting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.